Uh, good afternoon. I'm Peter Foss. I'm proud to be the president of the University of New Orleans. I welcome all of you on behalf of all of our students, faculty, and staff. And I'm actually really happy about today's event for many reasons. One in particular is that our partnership with Benjamin Franklin High School. We share the same campus, and I've been working really hard since I'm president to make our relationship a little more stronger and do more things. And um, I can't be more proud than to host this town hall t today on our campus. And now I'd like to introduce the principal of Benjamin Franklin High School, Dr. Tim Rusnak. Thank you very much, Dr. Foss, and uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here today and welcome everyone. I mean, this is a wonderful, wonderful event, and we think that it's the beginning of opening new doors in education throughout the state of Louisiana. Uh, a few housekeeping things. First of all, of course, if you have a cell phone or a pager or a, uh, some kind of uh, centrifuge or maybe a nuclear device, turn it off right now, okay? We don't want anything going on right now. Uh, I would like to again thank Dr. Foss and, and opening up this venue and everyone in his administrative staff. They've been absolutely wonderful, especially Dr. McClinn, who bore a lot of the, uh, a lot of the work here. I want to thank Tavi Shaw, Franklin class of 09, because she helped with the advertisements and volunteers. Andrea Chin and also Matt Kindler. Andrea is from Propeller Group, and Matt Kindler is from 4.0 Schools. They are going to be handling the issue of question and answers. And if you notice the microphone there, they're going to be handling the uh, cards because in order to save time and facilitate this presentation, I'm sure there are many, many questions. They're going to be trying to handle that. I also would like to thank and welcome everyone in the Department of Louisiana Education. That's Diane Gauthier, Ken Bradford, Dave Leskwitz from the Department of Ed. They are here uh, looking on and uh, sort of, uh, we hope, giving a, a, a bit of a blessing over some of the things we have to say. And thanks so much also to Sal Khan for taking time from his very busy schedule to be at Benjamin Franklin High School for graduation tomorrow night and also honoring us with a few words of wisdom and his lovely family, and uh, I can't tell you how impressed we are. And I have to say, Sal, Esther is wonderful, okay? Esther is his secretary, so uh, renew her contract and give her a raise. <laughs> Most of all, I'd like to thank a few people, like Christy Reed, okay? She's an unsung hero and all this stuff. And also uh, people like Natalie Reinhardt and also Francoise McHugh. They are my staff, and they have worked diligently to try to make sense of all this, mostly sense of some of my nonsense that I have them do, usually. Let me talk about a few things that are going to happen today to set the agenda. Uh, Mr. Kahn will make a few remarks, and immediately after that, in the interest of time, he'll be answering some questions through the card system that I mentioned. And then, I believe it's going to be Ken Bradford from the Department of Education. He's going to make a few closing remarks. This whole thing should take about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And uh, after that, after the questions and answers, we invite you to go back to the back of the, the room area where you can purchase one of uh, Mr. Kahn's books and he'll be there to autograph them for you if you like. So without any further ado, it is certainly my pleasure and privilege to introduce Mr. Salman Khan founder of the Khan Academy, a nonprofit organization with the mission of providing free, high-quality education for anyone, anywhere in the world. Mr. Khan graduated from MIT in 1998 with three degrees, two Bachelor of Science degrees, one in mathematics and another in electrical engineering and computer science, and a Master's of Science degree in electrical engineering. He worked in a technology industry in Silicon Valley until the first bubble burst, after which he attended Harvard Business School. After earning a master's degree in business administration in 2003, Kahn became an analyst at a Boston-based hedge fund. In 2004, as a side project, he began tutoring his young cousin, who, by the way, later went to Benjamin Franklin High School, so there is a link here, in math. They communicated by phone and began using an interactive notepad. The electronic learning project captured the interest of business people, including Mr. Bill Gates, and the learning system took off in popularity. In 2010, 
Kahn was listed in Fortune's annual 40 Under 40, which recognizes businesses' hottest rising stars, as well as Fast Company's list of the most 100 creative people in business. He was recently profiled by 60 Minutes and recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, to immigrant parents of in, from India and Bangladesh, and his first book, The One World Schoolhouse Education Reimagined, was just released in October of 2012. Without any further hesitation, let me introduce to you and help me welcome Mr. Salman Khan. usually is a capital sigma. All of these interactions are just due to the gravity over interstellar, or almost you could call it intergalactic. This animal's fossils are only found in this area of South America, a nice clean band here. Notice this is an aldehyde and it's an alcohol. Of course, is their 30 million plus the 20 million dollars from the American manufacturer. They create the Committee of Public Safety, which sounds like a very nice committee. This is not Eve. No, Botticelli's portrayed the ancient goddess of love. This is 6 times 6 times 6, or 216. I'm told the humidity makes it feel hotter. Why is this? Excellent question, LeBron. Let's just, like, make it... Love it! Play with the pendulum and get a feel for how it moves. Function as a bridge rectifier. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. <laughs> So, so just to give a snapshot of where contact is today, uh, we, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what we had, but uh, we now do over 80 million students around the world. Uh, we've got over a million exercises. We've watched over a quarter of a million videos. Uh, we do 3 million exercises every day. We use it in pretty much every country. Uh, 30,000 classes are using contact in, in some way. Uh, but before kind of talking about that and, and where we're going from here, I really just want to take a step back and, and talk a little bit about, about how all this uh, got started. Uh, as was introduced by Dr. Lovnack, if we rewind back to 2004, uh, I had uh, just gotten married. I was an analyst at an investment firm in Boston. And uh, after my wedding, my family from New Orleans, which is visiting over here today, uh, were visiting me in Boston. And it just came out of the conversation that the oldest of the cousins I was visiting, now that she's 12 years old, she had just, she was exiting out of sixth grade and, and she was having trouble with that. And because of that, she takes a place of the exam and a place of the exam was placing her into the soul and math track. And so I, I chatted with her. I said, you know, how do you What's going on? And she said, oh, you know, you have to kilometers to meters, uh, ounces to gallons, whatever else. And so I said, you know, how do you do that? I'm 100% sure that you can have a unit conversion. You're a very bright young woman. So we share a certain amount of DNA. Uh, and, and she seemed a little bit uh, skeptical, so I said, look, here's the deal. How about you go back to New Orleans, and every day have to work for me, and after school for you, we, we work for each other. We'll get on the phone, and if you can find something on the internet, we can see each other's writing, but we, we, I, I'm going to introduce you afterward. And she was, uh, so we, we started. So this was August of 2004, and uh, you know, long story short, uh, she, was, she had difficulty first, and, and then she caught up. She, she was able to get into the conversion. Then the fact that she got a little bit ahead of the curve, at that point I became what I call a tiger cousin. And I, <laughs> I, I called up for school, and I said, you know, I really think that not here or not, should you take that picture? And I said, who are you? 
we then fast forward 18 months, and a bunch of things that happened over the next 18 months. Uh, the, the firm I was working for, and I need to put it very generously, was my boss and his dog. Uh, his, his wife, my boss's wife, uh, became a, 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 a professor at, uh, at Stanford. So we moved the whole firm over to Northern California. And uh, I started writing this little quizzing software for my cousin. I set this up as a not-for-profit, really not appreciating at that time that it would be what I would kind of 
do for, for a living. But by 2009, it had taken over my life. It was what I was thinking about. It was, uh, you know, I was every, every minute of work, I was seeking a way to make a video. I was, uh, uh, it, it was all I was thinking about it. And uh, my wife and I sat down. She saw that this is, this is where my passions were. We had some savings for essentially a job in our house. Uh, but I kind of thought, and we kind of thought, that, hey, you know, someone should realize this is not for profit, but the social return on investment, that for, the, for a very small budget, this is stuff that reach, you know, at a moment of reaching hundreds of thousands per month, maybe one day millions per month, and tens of millions. And so uh, I took the plunge, uh, I quit my job, we lived off the savings for a little bit. And, you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurial stories, and this one's case is not for profit one, but they, they kind of start off the same, and I'm sure there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience. You, you kind of have to be a little bit delusional, you have to be a little bit naive. Uh, you can take that jump, and, and, and frankly, things don't happen as, as fast as you would assume. Uh, I, we were getting, you know, some five, ten dollar donations off of PayPal, uh, so if any of y'all thank you, uh, <laughs> uh, but about nine months into it, frankly, um, I had probably 50 conversations with 50 different foundations, and they all thought it was an interesting project, but no one had really um, stepped up. And, and uh, I was stressed, I was getting insecure, uh, I, I literally, you know, I was updating my resume, and not quite sure how the financial world would treat someone who tried to start a not-for-profit. And uh, right, right when that was happening, uh, a $10,000 donation came. So I needed to look at who was this, and her name was Ann Dover. She had her email address there. I, I, she was local. She was also in Northern California. So I sent her a, an email and I say, thank you very much uh, for, your, for your generous donation. This is the largest donation that Khan Academy has ever received. If we were a physical school, we would not have really named after you. <laughs> and uh, she literally, it was, it was, it was within, within hours, she, she, she replies back and she says, well, you know, I, I love what you're doing. My, my daughter uses Khan Academy. I do some of your stuff to understand the financial crisis. Uh, on local, we should, we should get lunch. I'd like to learn more about it. And so we, we meet at a literally Indian buffet restaurant in, in uh, <laughs> right here, Stanford. And uh, Anne asks me, well, she says, well, you know, what, what's your vision here? And I said, well, you know, when the IRS, you have to literally talk to people who are going to be not for profit. And they, and they have a like, mission colon and like a line on that. And, and, and I said, well, I pulled out a free world class education for anyone anywhere. And, and Anne said, well, that's ambitious. Um, <laughs> how, how do you see yourself doing that? And I said, well, you know, it's, it's a mission, but I think we can make some progress there. I, I, I like making these videos, and they already seem to be getting traction. Uh, we can get other people to make videos, we can translate them into the languages of the world. Uh, but then I showed her some of the software that I've been working on for my class, and I said, look, the videos are, in my mind, are only a small part of what, what this could be. We can have interactive software, so we can get practice, we can get feedback, a way to for students to connect with one another. And, uh, and Anne, you know, she, she looks at this, she's like, you know, it's, it's ambitious, but you, you're, you're kind of making progress, uh, but, but, you know, how are you supporting yourself? And in as, as proud of a way as possible, I, I, I said, I'm not. <laughs> and uh, Anne, Anne kind of nods a little bit, and, you know, we made the bill, and, and uh, we, we head on our, our, our separate ways. I get in my car, and I got on the bicycle. And, uh, Literally 10 minutes later, I'm driving into my driveway and I, I get a text message from Anne. And so it, and it says, uh, you really need to be supporting yourself. I just wired you $100,000. But that was a good thing. <laughs> I now think the text message is very serious. <laughs> And that actually was just a, a, a beginning of a long series of, of crazier and crazier events. You fast forward a month, a, about a month, I was running this little summer program. You know, I met this virtual teaching guy, and I was fascinated. Hey, look, if lectures can happen someplace else, if, 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 if things can happen at students' time and pace, what can you do in, inside of a physical environment? And so I had a, uh, a group of middle school students in this camp, and I had six kids playing a game of risk. And then I had the other 20 students trading securities based on the outcome of the game. And uh, why was we were trading for both of these? And, and while that was happening, uh, I, I got another series of text messages from Eric. So I need to do one text that was right. And it was actually hard to read. 
But she said, I'm at the Aspen Ideas Festival uh, in the main pavilion. There's a thousand people in the room. Bill Gates is on stage with Walter Isaacson. And for the last five minutes, he's been talking about Khan So I, I didn't know what to make of this. So I, I booped the nearest seventh grader off my computer. And I start, I start looking for some evidence of, of this event that Anne is, is, is talking about. And it took about 10 minutes. I found people who were writing a blog about it. Uh, about an hour later, I actually found the, the video footage of the event. It was literally uh, Walter Isaacson, who's in the world stage, by the way. Walter Isaacson on stage with, with Bill Gates. And Bill Gates just randomly starts talking. He's like, yeah, you know, this thing I'm excited about, the site called Khan Academy. I use it with, with my kids. I use it myself. And when I heard that, I became a little nervous. <laughs> Those videos were for not and, uh, and then, frankly, that evening, it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was kind of a strange reality for me. So I said, well, this thing happened. What do I do now? Do I call him? I assume he's not listening. And uh, they, they, they left me in that, in that kind of weird state for about two weeks. Two weeks that I'm literally, uh, the recording show is walking across, and I've never walking across, and I'm sitting there, about to do a video with my cell phone action. It's, it's from, from Seattle. Hello? This is Larry Cohen, I'm Bill Gates' chief of staff, and you might have heard Bill's fan. Yeah, I, I heard that. <laughs> if, if you're free in, in, in the next few weeks, uh, we'd love to fly you up to Seattle and find out how we can support you. And, and I was looking at my calendar for the month of the <laughs> Completely blank. <laughs> So we met, and, and I, I essentially told, I called Bill now. Uh, I told Bill uh, the, 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 the same thing that I told Anne. Uh, and around the same time, frankly, it was uh, all independent events. And around the same time, Google reached out uh, and, and literally brought me in. It was like, you know, the first meeting, they, they just want to learn more about what I was doing. Apparently, a lot of engineers were using contact with their kids. In the second meeting, they said, what would you do with $2 million? I said, Is this an open question? <laughs> Foundation uh, and, and Google on top of uh, Anne and John Doerr were there to kind of really allow Khan Academy to, to get to the next level of the organization, get office space, start hiring up the team. And what we what we started working on, what we started working on was essentially an extension of some of the software that I was doing with my cousins. So this right here we call our knowledge map, and it's kind of a general framework about how we think about things. Right now the interactive stuff on Khan Academy, some of y'all are probably familiar with it, is predominantly mathematical. You already saw the videos go well beyond that. And eventually we want the interactive stuff too as well. But the general idea is each, each circle here is a concept in, in mathematics. And at the very top of it, you have just basic addition. And as you get further and further down, you get to more and more advanced mathematics, all the way down to the calculus, and one of those is beyond that. And the general idea is as you show proficiency in a simple concept, a more basic one, it starts moving you to more and more advanced concepts. And on one level, that's completely obvious. That's how a, uh, that's how a video game would work. You beat level one, then you go to level two. That's how you would learn a martial art. You, you take the white belt exam, and now you're a yellow belt. But what we, what we point out is this is not the way that a traditional academic model works. In a traditional academic model, what we do is we, we group kids together by, by age. We move them together at a set pace. And we, you know, you have kind of lecture homework, lecture homework. And, and, and all of a sudden, after two weeks, you give an assessment. And let's say that assessment is on basic exponents. And let's say you get a 95%, you get an 85%, you get a 75%. And even, even though even 95%, you didn't know 5% of the material, you didn't know 25% of the material, uh, even though the, the assessment recognized that, the whole class then moves on to negative exponents, moves on to something that's more advanced. And to kind of put a proper lens on, on that idea, imagine if we applied it to other areas of our, of our life, like, like say, home building. So you, you, you get the contractor in, and you say, look, we've got three weeks to build this foundation. Do what you can. So the contractor does what they can. Maybe it rains. Maybe the supplies don't quite show up. Three weeks later, you get the inspector to show up. And, and the inspector says, well, you know, the concrete's not quite dry over there. That part isn't quite up to code. 
I had given it 85%. Oh, great, that's a B minus. Let's build the first floor. And you, you build the first floor, saving process, and you have two weeks, maybe so the contractor falls sick, whatever they can do, they do. Inspector shows up two weeks later. It's a 75%. Great, let's build the second floor, third floor, fourth floor. And then all of a sudden, you're building the fourth floor, and while you're building the fourth floor, the whole thing collapses. And if your reaction is the way that many people react in, in education these days, it's, oh, I must have had a horrible contractor. Or they'll say, oh, we didn't have enough inspection. Maybe I, I needed to inspect more. Maybe the inspections had to be better. But any, any reasonable look at what just happened, it wasn't the contractor, it wasn't the inspection, it was the process. You were artificially constraining how long you had to, to do something. And then when you actually identified that there were gaps, you ignored them and you built on top of that. You, you identified, you artificially constrained that the kids have three weeks to learn basic exposure, all the kids are at different levels. Uh, a week or three weeks later, you do an exam, and even though you identified that a lot of them didn't get basic exponents, you, you somehow expect them to understand negative exponents. So what we say is instead of, instead of artificially holding fixed how long you have to learn something, and the variable is how well you learn it, the A, B, C, D, do it the other way around. What should be variable is when you learn something and how long you have to learn it, essentially personalizing to, to the individual students what, what, whatever their needs are, and what should be fixed is that everyone learns at a very, very high level. Everyone should understand exponents at 100% before they move on, before they move on to negative exponents. And just to get an idea of what some of these exercises look like. There you go. This right over here is one of them. I like to show this one because it's kind of Montessori for calculus. You can change the slope of the tangent line at any point to understand what a derivative is. That was a review for all of you. <laughs> There's videos there if you need help. And some of them are literally you know, basic as adding fractions. But it gives you a sense that you can do things in this form factor that you couldn't have done with a traditional textbook or you couldn't have done with a traditional chalkboard. When, when all of this started, and this is you know, now, not that long ago, 93 years ago, we got that first funding from the Gates Foundation and from Google, the, the uh, uh, assumption was that the Khan Academy is going to be the same that exists outside of a formal school system. We, at, at the moment, at that point, we were already at million students were using it every month. Uh, but a local school district reached out and said, look, we're kind of intrigued by what you're doing. Uh, what would you do if you could do anything with a fifth grade math classroom? And I thought it was just complete high in the sky. They came, so I said, look, uh, we think the, the whatever we can call the lectures or the explanations, those could happen at a student's own time and place. Uh, you know, the exercises can happen at their own time. So why don't we have a class where every student goes at their own pace? master's concept before moving on, and we leverage class time, that scarce class time, for the human beings to actually interact with each other. So the students to, to tutor each other, for them to have one-on-one -on -one time with the teachers, for the teachers to lead them through the more hands-on projects. And uh, somewhat surprisingly, this district said, yeah, that, that's exactly what we believe in. This is differentiated instruction. It's mastery-based learning. We want the kids to interact with each other. We want to, we want to try it out. And so we got started with them, and a lot of, uh, of what y'all might see is that the teacher dashboards that I, I'm, I'm assuming some of y'all might be using um, really came out of that pilot with the Los Alamos School District. And we also learned a lot about how the classroom, you know, this is all theoretical at this point, but what could the classroom look like in this world? And so this right over here is one of those, one of those reports, and all of this is available, it's all free, and uh, I'm assuming some of y'all might be using it in your classrooms. Each row here is a student in this fifth grade math classroom. Each column here is one of those concepts that you saw on that knowledge map. And it literally updates in real time for the teacher. And, and what it's saying is, look, this student right over here, green and dividing fractions, that means they've already shown proficiency in it. These students are blue and units, that means that they're working on it, but no need for worry. And this student right over here is red and exposed to three, that means that that student is stuck in somewhere. And so what we've seen emerge in the classroom is the teacher can either Say, oh, that, that student's having trouble. Well, there's a couple of other students who already know that material. Maybe I can pair them together and, and you can have peer instruction. Or I can go as a teacher and sit and do a very small focus intervention, really, with that student or a small group of students, and the other students can, can work on something that, that they find engaging. This is another report that teachers get, and I like to show this one because, it's, at least for me personally, it's, it's questioned a lot of the assumptions that, that frankly, even I made. Uh, when, when, you, when you assume who's a, a bright kid and, and who, who maybe is, is having more trouble. And, and just to understand what you're doing, this is a little complex, but this horizontal axis is just a measure of time. It's just the days on the site. 
The vertical axis here is just a raw count of how many modules the students are completing. And each line here is a student in this math classroom. And this math classroom is very similar to the math classroom that I think many of us grew up in. There's a group of students who are just racing against one. Day 10 is a group of kids, these lines up here, that are just really racking up more and more proficiencies. And the traditional models say, hey, those are the honors kids. They're going to be doctors and lawyers and engineers and whatever else. There's a group of kids in the middle right over here. And there's a group of kids that are lagging further and further behind. And usually in a traditional model around middle school, it was, uh, it was happening to my cousin, you separate them. You say, those are the honors kids, those are the average kids, these are the remedial kids. But what we're seeing is if you don't do that, and you let them all work at their own time, at their own pace, you let them work on concepts that might be even behind grade level, but you don't separate them out of class. That the same student, this blue student is one of them, that, that you thought of day 10 was below average, two months later becomes the best student in class. And we're seeing this in public schools, private schools, charter schools, rich neighborhoods, and poor neighborhoods. There hasn't been a, 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 a use case where we haven't observed this dynamic. But the same kids that you assume just couldn't get it, you allow them, in this student's case in particular, he, he couldn't get negative numbers. This was an algebra class, so he was a little bit behind. But after he, he spent a lot of time getting negative numbers, after he got that, he just raised his head to be the best of the best in the class. This here is some, you know, and we can talk more about this in the, in the Q&A. Uh, this, this is from one of the clouds we're doing in Oakland, Cal Oakland, California, which is an underserved community. And well, there's a bunch of powerful things here. One was just, the, well, obviously, just the change in test scores. Uh, blue was, so they gave a summer pretest. This is an algebra class. Blue was, Pre, pre working with us, red was uh, after working with us. In the summer pretest, you see that the cohorts entering are completely identical. But then as you go, as you go into each of the algebra exams, you see that the red is outperforming more and more and more. And that's kind of consistent with this idea. But in a traditional model, you just let these gaps persist and there's no way to address them. And frankly, we saw a lot of these kids, these were, were, were ninth graders who, who didn't know their multiplication tables. And in a traditional math class, there's no way for an algebra teacher to, to address that. But if you allow these students to address these large gaps that they had in their, in their, in their learning, they can do as good as any time. And, and that by itself was exciting. I mean, if you look at the number of students who are performing at a high level of proficiency, it was, a, it was an order of magnitude different. But what's probably the most thoughtful thing when we heard from the teacher is that these are students, and I think many of the educators should appreciate this, that you know, they used to be, all right, teacher, what do I do next? All right, I'm good. No, I'm not good at math. Uh, you know, it was very passive. It was uh, pushing everything on the teacher. Tell me what to do next. And by allowing these students to take ownership of their own learning, to have agency over themselves, they, they became active problem solvers. They said, don't tell me the answer. I need to solve this. This is my goal. Teacher, can you help me? So it became much more pulling the information as opposed to pushing, pushing the information on them. The other thing that we remind ourselves at Khan Academy is, you know, we're excited about the classrooms. There's 30,000 classrooms using us. Uh, and and we, we continue to invest a lot there. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's still, frankly, millions of people around the world, not tens of millions, who have an incredible potential, and, and you just have to give them a few tools so that they can actually tap into them. And this video right here is, is probably one of the more powerful uh, evidences you, 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 you see in the back. My name is Mark Halberstadt. Growing up, I was really always a C student. I pretty much thought that the only thing I was good enough to do in college was major in music. But I, I sort of almost felt that it was more I was getting it because I was terrible at everything else. Really what I wanted to do was electrical engineering. And the last thing that I remember completely not getting was trig identities. So I went to YouTube and I did a search for trig identities and Khan Academy was the first thing that popped up. I watched a bunch of videos in the trig playlist to kind of get caught up to speed. I watched all the videos in the calculus playlist. I watched all the videos in the physics playlist. I watched a, a lot of videos on arithmetic. I took a leap and I decided to go back to school and went to uh, Temple University, majored in electrical engineering, getting a second bachelor's. And keep in mind, I, I was really a straight C student growing up. And I just finished this year, first year back in college, I got a 4.0 GPA for the entire year. I got perfect scores on both of my calc final exams and also on my chemistry final exam. I ended uh, calculus, chemistry, both calculus classes, Calc 1 and 2, and chemistry with an average higher than 100%. There are some Khan Academy videos that I probably listen to the same concept over 20 or 30 times. And there is no tutor in the world I could have paid to have sat
sat next to me and repeated the same thing over 20 or 30 times without at least them getting a little bit judgmental or at least them getting, thinking like, oh, well, this guy really is never going to get this concept and he should just give up. Where the understanding really happened was watching those videos and, and also working through the Khan Academy software and everything. The impact for me in my life, I, I really see it growing exponentially over the next 20 or 30 years. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Mas é claro que ele fez muitas e muitas e muitas outras coisas importantes. So the one thing I want to emphasize, you know, obviously this, this, this all started with, with, with me and my cousins, many of whom are, are here today, uh, but, but it's now many, many more people. We're, we're now a team of, of 40 folks. And, and you know, what I, what I was pointing out is it, it definitely feels like we're at a, at a special time in history uh, where, where we can start to reach far more people than, than we ever thought possible. And just over the last year, our, our team has averaged about 34 folks, and we, we were able to reach 50 million people around the planet. And it's actually a fun unit conversion problem going back to now. If, uh, 
if, if this is a centimeter tall, and we were to actually draw this to scale, it would actually be 20 kilometers tall. The, the original tag record was just in the 70s. <laughs> I know some he has kids, right? He has a laptop and a bell. <laughs> so, you know, as, as, as we we're just saying, you know, it's, it's uh, we're, we're, we are, by any measure, at the point of history, you know, the information revolution, we hear about it every day, but we should lose sight of, of what a big deal it is. And, and every time you have these, these inflection points in, in, in history or society, it, it's, it's both a, it's difficult, but it's also an opportunity. And it's usually the time that you have, have, have new institutions arise. Uh, if you talk about you know, the, the printing press, the newspapers come out shortly afterwards. You talk about uh, the, the European colonization of North America. You have your, your, your Ivy Leagues, your Harvard and your Yale. You talk about the Industrial Revolution. That's when you have your land grant colleges, the state universities. That's when your engineering schools start to emerge. And the inflection point that we're in right now is at least as big as any of those. And the hope is that uh, Khan Academy, and it was a very delusional hope when I was literally sitting in a closet uh, two years ago filling out IRS paperwork, but getting a less delusional one every day, is that maybe we can be an institution that, that takes advantage of this inflection point. And we can go to a world where this thing that we call, we call education, uh, this thing that is historically the, the key determinant between the, the haves and the have-nots, uh, the thing that's traditionally expensive and scarce, uh, doesn't have to be. It's, it's something that we can start to distribute broadly. And it isn't just, you know, traditionally when you do charity, you say, okay, well, what do the middle class have? What do the affluent have? You look at that, you're like, okay, well, that's expensive. We can't, we can't, we can't give that to every kid. Let's create a cheaper version of it and bring it to a village in Africa or a village in India because those, those kids frankly have nothing. What's exciting about, I think, where we are right now in, in civilization is we don't have to make that compromise anymore. We can give the Zayas of the world, of the Mongolian orphan, orphan, not a cheap approximation, but we can give her the exact same resources as Bill Gates' kids. And if we're in that type of reality, it's, it's exciting to, to think about what happened. One, this thing that we thought was scarce and inexpensive, it becomes common, ubiquitous, it becomes, frankly, like clean drinking water shelter, something that we all expect, like, like a human right. And if we can do that, if we can accelerate the people who, you know, how many people who are doing cancer research today? Maybe 5,000. If we can accelerate that to 5 million, what could that do for society? If there's a, for all we know, Zaya could be the, the person who, who finds the cure for, for the next major disease. So personally, I'm just excited where we are. I think, you know, it's like we're living in the middle of a, of a science fiction book, and I, and I look forward to going on this, uh, this adventure with y'all. Thank you. was thrilling. Thank you so much. Um, so the first question comes from a professor, um, English professor at Southeastern University. And her question is, people tend to suggest your videos for struggling students, but would they be less likely to get much out of the video lectures with weak numeracy and very weak study skills? And in your opinion, is there an inappropriate audience for your online courses? Um. You know, it's, 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 it's an open question. We, we don't know who, I mean, we're, we're discovering every day who it might work for and who it, who it might not work for. Uh, uh, you know, it, for us, if it works for something, it's great, but we won't make any claims that it's going to be for everyone. But we do hear every day, I mean, new, new use cases that we want to, I mean, literally just a few weeks ago, I heard that people are using it in prison systems, which, you know, on, on, on some level, they're, they're, they're passive audience, so that's... <laughs> No, but I mean, you know, so we're, we're discovering, I mean, seriously, that I mean, you could go there and actually become better as opposed to, uh, uh, so, so I, I, we can't make any broad claims, we, we're, we're 
studying it as well as we can. Uh, the college students, uh, you know, obviously the, 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 the videos are what they are, they, they use the language that they do. I, I kind of, the philosophy that I've always had the, 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 the videos personally, although I'm not the only person making videos anymore, is, you know, be conversational, whether I'm, whether I'm doing um, kindergarten math or I'm doing, you know, college level science, um, I'm, I'm talking in the same tone that I'm using now. And, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll, we'll see where, where the boundaries are, but, you know, if, if this doesn't work for a certain demographic or a certain use case, we want to figure out what it does. A big part of what we want to do is now that we're getting all this data, is how can we run experiments so that we can optimize for it for individuals. Right, here's one from a student. Um, if you want to study a subject, but initially find yourself somewhat uninterested, what should I do to generate interest in the subject? That's a, no. Uh, well, you know, that's an Well, I'll answer the other way, because some people ask me all the time, like, you know, you sound excited about everything you're doing. Uh, and, and, you know, I, 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 I mean, my, my wife is here, she'll tell me that I do have a, ability to think that whatever I'm doing at the moment is the absolute most fun, amazing thing to be doing at that moment. And I, I do recommend that view on life because you'll always be happy. Uh, but it is, you know, it, 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 it sometimes makes, I, I, I get a little sad when, when there are, I mean, pretty much anything, whether you're talking about from organic chemistry to cosmology to history, they're fascinating. They're, uh, you know, they, they tap into our natural human curiosity. Um, and and it's, it's, it's almost, I, I feel sometimes hard to make it something that is, that is uh, not interesting. But, you know, if, if I was a student who is not feeling that, um, that, that passion at the moment, um, you know, I, I, I would try, I, I would just keep, you know, hopefully we can play some part of the role there, and our videos are perfect, and we're trying to bring in, not only, hey, you can appreciate it from a theoretical point of view, but we can bring in folks like LeBron James, who can give it more of a, of a practical aspect to it. Um, but yeah, I would say just, just there, is a, there is kind of a nugget of beauty in, in pretty much any domain. And there are people who are literally devoting their lives to, to understanding those domains. And hopefully, I think all of us as educators and as students need to just remember that. All right, the next question is from Eric Lavin, um, an ed tech entrepreneur. His venture is called Whetstone Education. Um, can you paint a picture of what a teacher's job looks like if schools are truly flipped? and all instruction is delivered along, a, along an individualized learning path through digital content. All right, yeah, um, and, and uh, I, I talk a lot about this in the book, and obviously I've alluded to it a little bit, but you know, the, the, way, the way I see it, imagine education is this, this big spectrum of things. Uh, you know, this end is your rope skills, this is your multiplication tables, and your, your, uh, your, your grammar and vocabulary, and you go further and further, you into more open and more creative skills. This is, you know, writing an essay, now you're you know, composing a sonata, writing a computer program, writing a business, whatever it might be. And traditional education has been, it's not just the road stuff, there's obviously you do a lot of non-road stuff in the process, but it's roughly in this, in this area around right here. And, and the way we think about it is if we can start to take pieces of that out of what has to happen in physical class time, it allows the physical environment to move off the value chain. And so uh, the, the classrooms of the future, we imagine, and you know, I would expect to capture the book of the classroom of the future, uh, where it is, uh, you know, I, instead of a, as soon as you remove the, the, the lecture from the classroom, you no longer have to have 30 desks all pointed at the chalkboard. You no longer have to have a room that you can about to have a, a more inspiring space where, where people can talk and collaborate. Uh, you, you, would, you would have a, you no longer, teaching right now can actually be a very isolated profession. You're, if it's you and you're 30 students, if it's you and another 30 students, uh, you can have two teachers with, with, with their collective students, uh, kind of tag team teaching. You can have multi-age group. As soon as you have, you break the paradigm of everyone going at the same pace, why not have nine-year-olds and 12-year-olds and seven-year-olds in the room together? And I think you're actually then tapping into a very natural human instinct, which is mentoring each other. But, that I, I, I personally believe a lot of teenage angst. I mean, teenagers uh, biologically can have children. Uh, I don't recommend it. But, uh, <laughs> But that means that there are people with significant responsibility. And, and I think right now we, we don't allow them to have responsibility. We, we say you're only worried about yourself, you only have to pass this for this is what you have to do. But I think if you gave them responsibility over their, their, their younger peers and enter them, I think it would be an interesting thing. So, you know, classroom of the future, I imagine it's kind of a, you know, I, I, I have young children, my, my son's four, and about to go to uh, kindergarten. Uh, I, I wanted to go to a physical school, but I wanted to be far more interactive than what I went to. What 
he goes on and mentoring his peers, tutoring his peers, doing projects. I don't want it to be fingers on your lips, you know, be quiet. I want it to be, no, you should be talking. You should be, you should be collaborating with each other. Uh, and it shouldn't be based on, you know, did you spend a year in your chair, uh, with good behavior, but did you learn it? Did you retain it? Did you learn the material? All right, so a quick question. An update on Nadia. An update on Nadia. Yes, yeah, so I tell Nadia there's a lot of writing on her success. <laughs> it's, it's funny, I, I gave a talk um, about a year ago at a, at, a, at, a, at a South Asian event, entrepreneurial event, and someone asked that question. And then I, I said, oh, you know, Nadia's a star Lawrence, she's majoring in writing, she's like a very good writer. And then a lot of people said, oh, I don't know about this one. And I said, oh, but she's pretty bad. And I said, oh, All right, the next question is from a teacher at Sci High, Tim Schwartz. Um, do you ever record a lesson that you just that just doesn't seem to work? How do you know? Um, do you re-record and what are the keys to a successful video lesson? Yeah, so no, all the time. I mean I think I think the uh, there's all the time that I start to do a video and I just it just doesn't flow, it's just not coming out from me and I feel like I'm doing it artificially or I'm you know it just I'm not connecting with it. I'm not, uh, and then I'll just stop and I'll try to do it again. Uh, I, I think the key is, you know, I, I, I've gotten in trouble, uh, you know, on the press saying that, oh, you know, I, I sometimes don't know what I'm about to say. And, and what, what I'm really saying is, you know, well, I, I guess I'll compare it with, 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 with traditional education material. A lot of times, it's almost like, oh, we're going to create a video that's going to be watched by you know, millions of people. Uh, you know, we got we to do this right. We'll get a big group together. They'll write a script. Then they'll go hire, you know, the same person who recorded the GPS device. Uh, to, to, to read it while you have some computer graphics and say, you know, the next step of photosynthesis is on the mitochondria. And, and, and it looks very professional, but it's, it's very hard to connect with. And, and so what, what I try to do is I, I definitely prepare about it. I definitely try to read as much as I can, understand the subject, I'll call up friends or a, who, who, are, who might be, you know, experts in the field. But then I, once it's distilled in my own mind and I feel like it's, it's gotten simpler, um, then, then only, then only, and only once I'm excited, will I do it. I, I mean, I actually do this school. Like, before I do a video, I really force myself to laugh and I force myself to smile uh, because I think it does, it does carry over the whole thing of the video itself. I want to ask one question. Um, so I think one of the things that is so fascinating about what you're doing is the analytics behind students, the analytics behind those charts of children moving up. Can you tell us a little bit about what you personally are most interested in, the data that you are interested in exploring that's behind how kids are picking data, uh, picking up knowledge? Yeah, this is what we're, you know, our 40 people on our team, about two-thirds of them are data scientists and software engineers. And, and so, you know, we are, we have three million problems to be done every day on the site. And so it's actually a huge opportunity in terms of education research, where we can, as we speak, there's 20 experiments running on Khan Academy, where 5% of the, of the people who show up on the site are getting a slightly different experience. And this is stuff that you know, Amazon.com and other Netflix does all the time to figure out, hey, how do I increase the probability you're going to watch another movie? Or how do I increase the probability that you're going to click on buy in the case of Amazon? We can do those same experiments where we change things a little bit and say, hey, how does this affect when the student comes again? How does this affect when they retain the material? And one of the things that we're really focused on right now is doing really high quality diagnostics and assessments so that we really have a sense of where she is at that moment. And then we have these experiments that can just become large scale and research and cognitive experiments where we say, hey, this tutorial versus that tutorial, would that lead to a better outcome? This exercise versus that one. Uh, this color button versus that color button. So uh, one of the things that we hope is that actually we can become a platform for, for researchers and we've already started working with them. Great. So this question is from Jeff Parker, a Tulane professor. It's a little bit similar, I believe. Uh, many online businesses operate as platforms where developers extend the core functionality of the platform. Has Khan Academy started publishing APIs and SDKs to allow such ecosystem part participants, some of whom are profit motivated? Yeah, so, so we do have a, a, an API. For those of you all, an API is an application program interface where it allows other people to leverage maybe some of the, the infrastructure of Khan Academy. Uh, right now we use it mainly for kind of close partners of Khan Academy, uh, but we are thinking about how 
we, we can empower other people to, to leverage this. I mean, and our, our main motive is other groups that are, that are trying to do it from a, from a social point of view. Uh, but if we, you know, there's nothing wrong with the for profit, uh, but we want to just make sure it's, it's aligned with, with the broader interests. All right, so I think at this point they'd like us to open it up to the audience. So if anyone wants to come up and ask a question, yeah. come on up. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I actually was a 10 year out of math person, and your calculus videos totally helped me pass. Um, oh, wait, you, the video, we, Mark Hollis up there will stay up so we can. Awesome. Uh, you hired John Reese uh, last year to be the dean of the computer science department. Um, you started the computer science department roughly about a year ago. How do you feel about how that's uh, moving forward? And um, do you feel that computer science is something that should be brought more into early learning education as opposed to just like college level? Yeah. Is it John Reese? Yeah. 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 So, you know, yeah, so it's, it's actually, I'll, I'll touch on that because this has actually, I think, been one of the powerful things for us in general about how much your question is. Who he's mentioning, John Ressig, he's literally the world's top JavaScript programmer. And, um, and he could have gone anywhere. And it was actually worried as a not for profit that we're going to be able to get really incredible talent. And what we're saying is we can't give people stock options, we can't give them a lottery ticket to Google gives them or Facebook gives them. But we get John Ressig, Craig Silverstein, who's literally Google's first employees on our, our team. I mean, that could go down the list. So we're getting um, some, some, some of the top people on the planet to work on this problem. Uh, but yeah, the computer science stuff that he did. The, the goal of it is, and for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's not videos, it's actually even not traditional exercises. It's a place where, 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 where students or anyone could go and you immediately start writing things and you see it animations and within literally 10 minutes you can make a screen save or an animation and really feel like you made something creative. And the stated goal when we, when we made it to answer your question was, look, look computer science is literally, you know, the, the core is all the reading, writing, arithmetic, but really if you want to empower someone, regardless of what field they go into, they should have some basic ability to do computer science to create things. And, uh, and, and you've also had huge disparities, obviously, from male dominating the field right now. And so the, the goal was, look, uh, can we make it appealing to, uh, actually, we said for, for fifth grade girls and the other 95% of boys? And, uh, and, and, and so, 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 you know, we've been testing it out, and I heard that all of them play around with it. Any of y'all have a phobia of, of programming or computer science? Try it out for, for half an hour, you'll actually surprise yourself with what you might be able to do. So absolutely, you know, it, I, you know we, I talk all this about classroom time being about doing stuff, creating things. The book is a lot about that. And that computer science was actually the first story. That too much of, you know, we're right now only measuring people based on their academic ability. You know, what we're going to say these words, and that matters to some degree. But what matters probably even more is, uh, one, uh, your ability to communicate with your peers and mentor your peers, and that happens with peer-to-peer -peer tutoring and you get feedback there. And then your portfolio of creative works. You know, what have you made? What, what, what have you started, you know, instead of just answering questions? And so that's what we've been hoping to do with computer science stuff. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stan. And um, <clears throat> with so much misinformation on the web, and in this room filled of, of, of educators that from elementary school to at the university level, how important is it for them to get their lectures and their information online, kind of like what you did, but on a more intimate scale on their expertise uh, for the people to say, would you recommend that they do that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, um, so, so the real wonderful thing that, that I hope happens, and we've heard a lot of stories of this happening, uh, you know, obviously time has to start from very small roots, just for me and my cousins. And the more we can get more educators putting content out there, at minimum for their own students. I mean, you know, back in the day, I thought it was worth me doing it because, hey, my 10, 15 cousins could use it. I didn't have kids at the time, but when my future kids could use it. Maybe their their aunt and their kids could, could use it one day. And that by itself, it, it was wild for me. Uh, but then, the, obviously, the more content we put out there, the more educators can do this. The more that was such that said, oh, that's, that's actually not just resonating with your students, that's resonating with a bunch of students. And one of the things we hope we'll have to do on Khan Academy, we obviously started with kind of a very small set of people, uh, is, and you're going to see a lot more of them, and actually, you know, I'm not trying to recruit some teachers in Frankfurt and other places, uh, actually all around the planet, uh, once that we find them that are, are really passionate about this, to, to in any subject, have multiple narratives. You know, maybe some people are resonating with something, some people aren't going to, and some people want a different voice, and we can actually measure who's, who's, who's most affected by different, in different ways. Uh, so I, I'd say absolutely, the more people that do it, the better.
Yeah, my question is involved, uh, your metaphor involving building a foundation of a house. Uh, it sounds very similar to an indictment of standardized testing, uh, your focus on differentiated instruction specifically. Uh, my question is, what's your opinion on the value of standardized testing, especially in relation to the push for it more and more in state education? Yes. So this one I, I answered right there. <laughs> the, uh, so I, I answered this whole chapter of the book about, about testing in particular. And I, I think there's a, there's a bunch of crazy layers to that onion. Uh, the, the main issue is that most standardized tests are actually quite superficial. And uh, because they're superficial, and if you're teaching to that somewhat superficial test, uh, and if that is the only measure by which you're measuring someone, then it does start to kind of create an artificial environment. Uh, and you start to practically miss out on a lot of things. And, and a lot of, you know, every time, if, if going back to the analogy, every time that people say, hey, our schools are broken, or you know, the kids' test scores aren't where they need to be, and kids in Estonia can pack a problem a little bit better than us, which is very true. Um, they say, oh, we need more rigidity. We need to, we need to put more testing, we need to put, you know, we need to change the curriculum, we need to micromanage what the teachers need even more closely. And that might, I, I stress might, that might help de-risk some of the, the very bottom performing, but it, it, it completely handcuffs really creative teachers, teachers who want to do open and get to their classrooms. And so what we're saying is, we want to, there, there is an aspect of, yes, like we want to measure whether you understand this concept, uh, but you're going to do it at your own pace, and it, it's really about freeing up the teacher so that much more can happen in the classroom, so that the teacher can get to take the student well beyond where, uh, where the traditional where the traditional curricula uh, might, might take them. And, and the other dimension that we are very serious about, I've been talking to a few university admissions departments, they're like, look, it's okay to worry about people's SAT scores and AP tests. I understand why you do that. Every high school is different. It's hard to compare one GPA to another. But that's just one dimension of what a human being is. We need to start thinking about looking at what, what creative things have they made. Why do you make that part of the university admissions process? And also, why do peer feedback on how good that student was and communicating to their peers and entering their peers? So we want, at the end of the day, what we hope, you know, maybe this is idealistic, the, the kind of the, the the credentials of the future or the assessments of the future. Yes, there's not one aspect that would be kind of traditional measurement of, uh, and, and hopefully it covers topics of, like, like I think statistics, law, I mean, the things that we don't even cover today that are probably more relevant to more, more people. But it covers that, but it also covers these other pieces of the person that are, that are probably more important. Yes, I have a more basic question. Um, if a student is working on their own and watches a video, and they just don't understand it. And they watch it again and again and again, and they just don't understand it. What do they do then? Yeah. No, that's, that's the key. I mean, you know, if, 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 if you're in the middle of nowhere and you've got no school or whatever, I mean, that's what you've got. And, and maybe you might be able to ask a peer or, or whatever else. The ideal case is that you have human beings around. You know, a lot of times when people talk about the flipped classroom, you know, the, the, the feedback I've had been, oh, you know, but, but the live lecture is so important because the students can ask me questions. And I was like, yeah, I, I agree with you 110%. In fact, the, it's so important that it should always be nothing but questions. It should be, if the, if the explanation part is students can get on their own, but then when they come to a live classroom, that's the time to ask questions. I mean, right now you have the, the situation where you're in a lecture and there's some kids might be very not to raise their hand, but, but frankly most aren't. Uh, then they go to homework by themselves, and, and unless you have a tutor or a parent or a sibling who can help you, you're kind of stuck and you can just engage and you come back. The reality that we're, we're hoping to see, we're seeing it more in our classrooms is, look, I mean, even if you didn't watch the video, that doesn't matter. The, the more important part is the problem solving, the more important part is the interacting with your peers and interacting with your teacher. So in this reality, you come to a classroom, you're working on your problem sets, preferably at your own pace. If you're having difficulty, now you have a whole community of people who, who might be able to help you. So the, the real emphasis is, Literally, this is coming from me, I made 3,000 videos, I think the videos are probably the least important part of it. What they help do is they catalyze taking the lecture off the table so that, so that the classroom can, can, can focus on exactly what you're saying. So if they have to have someone they can turn to to ask for help, and if they don't, they're stuck. Absolutely. No, I think, you know, there are some people that, and, you know, sometimes we've been able to learn things from a textbook, and, you know, it's kind of the same idea. Hopefully this is better than what happened in the traditional textbook. But, um, and you have the opportunity for your peers, but at the end of the day, that teacher is super duper duper important. I mean, everything, you know, 
it's funny because whenever people hear about Khan Academy, and I think sometimes the press writes these hyperbolic headlines, you know, the map of Khan. You know, like, <laughs> But Gene Rothbard Summers, you know, said, no, we should redeem the, the last name. We can, uh, uh, but, uh, but people assume, you know, virtual school, hey, this must be like Amazon.com versus Barnes and Noble. This must be like virtual finding somehow the first physical. But that's 180 degrees off of what we're saying. This is about virtual trying to allow physical to actually be physical. Allowing virtual so the physical can be the valuable resource of data so that you can interact with each other, so that you can, you can get to know the, the teacher. I, I, I met uh, Wendy Kopp of, of Teach for America, and I just asked her offhand, I said, you know, what do you notice of the, the, the teachers in the classrooms that are really moving the dial? And she said, you know, they're surprised you. It's not necessarily the best presenter, which we always associate with that must be the, that helps. It's not always the person with the PhD and whatever, I mean, that helps. It's the person who actually forms deep connections with the students and, and really gets the students to change their own mindset, gets the students to really take ownership of their learning that we see they consistently uh, uh, those are the ones that need to buy. And what we hope we can do is a catalyst for freedom free that up. So I see that um, your teaching system involves a lot of self-teaching. So how would you deal with students that really have little drive for learning or just don't want to take teaching into their own hands at all? Yeah, no, that's a, I mean, it's a fascinating question. Because when I, you know, when I started to see my cousins, they were pretty motivated. They, were, they wanted me to, to help them out. And I assumed that, hey, you know, something like this will work for what we all assume are the, the motivated kids. So maybe this is, you know, we assume 20% of kids, the 30% of kids. But one thing that we've seen, and we've even seen it through the letters, is that a lot of the people who are finding value are actually the people who are traditionally disengaged. They were embarrassed that they forgot a lot of the material. And, and you know, the point, what I always point out is, like, you know, and if you put a math class, there's always a kid in the back of the class, usually it's a boy, who raises his hand and says, when am I going to need to learn this? And then the, the teacher kind of says, oh, well, you know, if you become an engineer, I'm not going to become an engineer. Oh, well, if you become a doctor, I'm not going to become a doctor. And the teacher's kind of trying to figure out where it flies. And, and I think to some degree that the wrong interactions happen because you don't have kids in art class raising their hand and saying, what am I going to do to use this? You don't have that happening in, in philosophy class. You don't have, you know, PE class, a five foot nine Indian guy that would say, why am I going to take an orange ball and put it into a ten foot hoop? And, and, and the reason why that doesn't happen is because we, we were engaged. We were enjoying ourselves. We weren't feeling a little. And the reason why that is happening in the opera class is that kid is, I think, rightfully protecting his self-esteem. He's feeling lost. He might have these gaps in his knowledge. And the best way that he can protect his, his at that point, probably fragile ego is to say, oh, I don't need this. I don't need this. And but what we're seeing is, and we saw that in Oakland, where if you allow them to re-engage, it's, it's a, it's a, human beings are fundamentally motivated. You can't, you can't show me a four-year-old on the planet who will allow have to fight from having to be curious about something. Uh, you, can't, you can't find me a 16-year-old, uh, uh, the same boy who was just engaged in opera class, he goes home, he will, he will play a video game two months straight until he beats it. He's more motivated than, than any of us. So there's nothing intrinsically about him that's demotivated. It's just a matter of him feeling disengaged, and, and we've all felt that, and, and, and kind of protect himself. So our, our, our hope is, and I'm not saying it's going to apply universally, but we are seeing that if you allow people to do it in a, in a way that's safe for them, in a way that doesn't belittle them, in a way that they don't have to feel embarrassed, that they, they stay with their, their peers, uh, I, I think the, the group of motivated kids is, is far larger than any of us would guess. And um, what feedback have you gotten from like really traditional teachers that are used to like the non-flip classroom lectures and things like that? You know, we're, we're, not, we're, we're, we're kind of agnostic about how kind of, kind of is used. For us, it's a lot of discovery of how it can be used. And so it is being used in actually very kind of traditional models and sometimes with, with, with good results. And so for us, it's kind of just a discovery process with teachers across the spectrum. And every class is different, every teacher is different uh, on, on, on how, how this tool can work. I mean, every day we're discovering, discovering new use cases. But we do want to be a catalyst for, for really trying to understand where, where all of this can go, kind of unwind some of the assumptions we all have. Thank you. Mr. Kahn, I started teaching in 1969, and in 2008 I left as a superintendent. I notice also I'm the only one in here wearing a hat, and my hat's off to you. <laughs> Stop with the applause, I'm not finished. I notice that panaceas and programs have come and gone, but somehow or other this feels different. 
And the reason I think is because of your money back guarantee. That's just kind of how this works to me. I have recommended this stuff to you. I have written this on napkins, on placemat stuff, given it to people, adults. I have passed it on to everyone that I can think of. Now, I have a question. Can you tell me a little more about maybe Singapore math, how you do that, if that is something appropriate to talk about? The other thing I have is a question about the fact that I understand that you had gotten in connection with a school and the concept was you reversed the process, not maybe you, but they now do their homework in class and their preparation at night. They do you and someone says, go to this particular video, look at this, and then tomorrow we come back and we do the work. Now, is that correct? And the other thing I got too is your answer to this question, which I have always said when people ask me, when am I ever going to use this? I always tell them this, it'll help you to get girls and buy more beer. And it shuts them up. Thanks. <laughs> What we do try to do, and a lot of people ask us about curriculum and what standards we're using, uh, we hope to be a superset of all of the world's major standards. You know, in theory, someone who learns math really well in, in New Orleans should be able, if their family moves to Singapore, should do just fine in a, in a, in a math class there and, and vice versa. And so we are, we are trying to make sure that we have full coverage of the major state standards, especially the Common Core in the U.S., but doing it in a way that's not, you know, checkbox to be covered standards, but hopefully in a more cohesive, conceptual way. Uh, but we want to be a superset. I mean, we, I've been talking with people in Europe and Singapore and the school systems around the world just to make sure we can, we can, we can, we can cover it all. Um, the other part that you're alluding to, uh, as a couple people mentioned the flip class. This is an idea that predates me, predates Khan Academy. Uh, and frankly, people have been doing this in humanity seminars forever. You know, go read the book and we're going to talk about it in class. And business schools, hey, go read the case and we're going to have a case discussion when we come to class. It's been mainly in the sciences and the math that this hasn't been the case, where it's, hey, here's a, even at the university, we still have large lecture hall, and kids are taking notes, and they, and they, they feed it back at the final exam. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't my idea. Teachers around 2007, 2008 started emailing me saying, hey, look, you give a good lecture on the Krebs cycle or on factory polynomials. I'm having my kids watch this at their own time and face if they need it, and now class is all about problem solving. So it's exactly what you're describing. And what that frees up the class to do is now we'll go up there on case and do some of the other stuff that we talked about. This will be our last question, and then the State Department of Ed will have some closing remarks. This is going to be a good question. Promise. <laughs> <laughs> So especially as the last question, I want to say thank you for your time and your work. Khan Academy has helped me immensely on my educational journey. Um, as a future ed educator, hopefully elementary education, I want to ask, like in your talk about the foundation, how do I as a future educator avoid those gaps, especially in younger children? Um, I, I don't want them to have my same experience. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's fascinating. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the story of uh, a text of similar remarks. And one of our top engineers uh, flunked calculus four times. <laughs> and then he, he dropped out of college and he, uh, he became a salesman uh, for a networking company. And he became very, very successful. And he, at some point, he, he had an idea for a, a new type of router. And he apparently watched, like, he spent, like, a year on the Khan Academy and learning all this stuff, which will somehow allow him to build a router because I, which is strange because I'm not capable of building a router. <laughs> um, and, and, and for him, the big discovery, I mean, he's literally one of the, probably one of the smartest people I've ever known, is that when he got to campus, he just had all of these gaps in his knowledge that he didn't even realize he was not aware of. He just thought he was not smart so he just kept failing it. Uh, so, so what I would encourage you as an educator or a parent, and you know, I'm doing this kind of even going through the act of helping make some of this stuff, is, you know, one, just go through it yourself. You know, there should be no shame about any of this stuff. I mean, it's a, you know, most adults actually are, are embarrassed that they've forgotten a lot of their material from middle school, even though most adults have. And to revisit it, if you're a parent, you do that, it changes what happens in the household. The kids will look like, oh, my 40, 50-year-old mom or dad are doing it. Boy, that, that, I, I, I should do that, too. It'll change the conversation in the household. Um, if you're on your own kind of learning quest, it's going to change the student's mindset. So it's like, you know, my teacher isn't just feeding me knowledge. She's learning with me. She, she's also curious about things. 
Um, and, and so, you know, I would just, as, and, you know, and, you know I, 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 I really look up to all of you guys who are, for lack of a better, real educators. Um, because y'all are in the big up, you know. It's easy for me to say talk about mentoring students, but you guys are, are in it, you know, literally in the trenches. And, you know, as much as you can just remind yourself, because we're seeing it in the data, we're seeing it from the letters, that almost every student uh, does have that potential if you literally just tap, you know, you get past those first two layers, those defensive layers, you allow them to, to, to work on themselves in a way that they aren't embarrassed, in a way that they don't feel silly. Uh, and, and, you know, if you take it from there, you don't know all that. Thank you so much. Right, thank you. Good evening. My name is Ken Bradford with the Department of Education. And on behalf of the Department of Education and the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, we'd like to thank Mr. Kahn for his inspirational presentation tonight. We would also like to thank Dr. Rusnak from Ben Franklin High School and Dr. Foss from the University of New Orleans, as well as the staff that worked really hard today to put this together. So if you would, join me for a round of applause. This is a really exciting time for education in Louisiana. Progressive and dynamic learning innovations like Khan Academy are part of an overall movement in Louisiana that points to a very bright future for all the students in our state. I'd like to share a couple of opportunities that are forthcoming that involve Khan Academy. The first is that we're excited to learn that the University of New Orleans, in partnership with Ben Franklin High School, will be merging their pre-calculus coursework and offering an innovative con platform based dual enrollment course for high school students throughout the state. And we're very excited about that opportunity. <laughs> Additionally, we'd like to let everyone know that the Louisiana Department of Education in conjunction with the University of New Orleans and Ben Franklin Academy, who will be, Ben Franklin High School, who will be hosting, uh, hosting it for us this summer. We'll be offering a workshop on the Khan Academy tools. And we'll be offering that the third week of July. And we'll, we're very excited about that opportunity. And if you're an educator and you're interested in attending that opportunity in one of these workshops that will be facilitated by not only the Khan Academy staff, but Ben Franklin High staff and Department of Education staff, that'll be the third week in July and this evening, uh, prior to, uh, as we exit, uh, I'll be over here by the door uh, where Mr. Khan's going to be by his book signing. I'll be over there with my staff member, Diane Gaucher, and we can answer your questions about that summer professional development opportunity. So again, with that being said, I'd like to thank Mr. Khan one more time for coming back home and providing this opportunity for us. And I've coordinated many events before. And one more time, Dr. Rosneck, I want to thank you and the University of New Orleans for being such gracious hosts and making this happen tonight. Thank you again for your attendance. And I'll be available in the corner. I want Mr. Kahn and Diane Goshi to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.